All right, guys, thank you for coming. No problem, Jack. Thanks for having me, fellas. I couldn't get in touch with Trump for this list, so I guess we'll have to do it without him. That's too bad. Yeah, it's a real tragedy. So without further ado, let's get this show on the road. Good evening, gentlemen. Damn it. I didn't think you were coming. How come you didn't answer any of my messages? Stupid courtroom drama bullshit. Don't worry about it. Are we still doing this? Uh, yeah, let's start. So uh, we'll be ranking every episode of season two of The Walking Dead game. I assume you managed to play it, Donald? Uh, indeed, I did. All right, then. So let's start by... Well, wait. What is it? Joe told me you guys never reviewed 400 days in the last tier list. There's not a whole lot to say about it. It's not worth ranking, really. No, he's right. We should still rank it. But to be honest, I have to agree that I haven't that much to say about it. I'll say that it was a cool experiment that could have been a unique introduction to potential antagonists or allies that we meet in season two. But I think we all know how that turned out. Well, we do get to meet Bonnie. She's pretty cool, right? She joins our crew in S2 and helps us break out of Carver's camp, so I'd say she had a useful role. Bonnie, cool? Are you out of your goddamn mind? You picked lobster claws, didn't you? I mean, you've already got the snake tongue. You wish you had a way with words like me, George. At least I don't misspeak during my speeches, right, Obama? Let me be clear. Uh, none of us here are particularly good speakers, if we're being honest. What about me? Oh, screw you guys. Look, ignoring season two, she's the least interesting member of the cast in 400 days. Maybe only slightly above Wyatt, but at least he had a motivation. One thing I will appreciate about 400 days is that Nate was a pretty cool villain. He was intimidating and uncomfortable, but not necessarily an enemy, which was an interesting twist. I would also contribute that he had impeccable taste in undead women. Uh, never mind, strike that from the record. I don't need another lawsuit. I think it's an easy A tier. There is no way this episode is A tier. Sorry, George, but there's just nothing here. I found most of the characters pretty boring and the ending was anticlimactic. I would put it D tier. I just don't think it holds up very well. Kind of like my joints right now. I appreciate there's variance in gameplay depending on who you decide to play first, but it's not nearly creative enough for a second playthrough. It's going no higher than C, and even then I feel like I'm being generous, as I usually am. I have to agree with Donald that C tier seems most appropriate. It was experimental storytelling and it felt like it, but it does have enough positives to put it above being mediocre. Sorry, George. Well, I'm just happy for any Walking Dead content, guys. The more the better. Now, before we continue, I need to turn this site in dark mode before my eyes burn out. I always use light mode. What the hell is wrong with you? Okay, then. Let's begin season two properly. Starting with All That Remains. This episode in particular is probably my favorite of the entire season. Really? Why this episode? It comes down to how Clementine was handled as the main character. While I like a good chunk of season two, episode one is the only episode where I felt like we were playing her and not just ourself with Clementine being our avatar. The scene with Clementine at the camp, talking to the dog and focusing on survival is a great scene to show how much she has changed as a person without any input from the player. Her manner of speaking was also reminiscent of older Clementine. I don't agree, Barrack. I don't hate the episode or anything, but I feel like it had quite a few problems. Such as? Getting rid of Omid and Krista in the beginning was a, a bunch of malarkey, an excuse to throw Clementine out on her own. There was no buildup. It just happens in the span of 10 minutes. The pacing is all over the place, and then there's the whole dog bite drama, which makes no sense because even George could tell the difference between a dog and human bite. Huh? What makes you think Carlos didn't know? It was pretty clear to me that Carlos would do anything to protect Sarah from danger. Carver was still on their minds, and it wasn't beneath him to use human bait to lure people out, like what we see with Bonnie in episode two. The cabin group were all on edge. It makes sense that they would use plausible deniability for the sake of their own safety. Maybe, but I just think it's a dumb plot point. It led to one of the coolest gameplay sections in the franchise. Sneaking around the cabin, making use of Clementine being a kid by puppy dog, eyeing her way to getting help from Alvin and crawling through small spaces. Also, you cannot deny how great the shed scene is. It's so iconic that ex-Telltale members even named a team after one of the lines. I guess so. Well, Barack, I believe that this episode is more interesting than the first episode of season one, but I don't think that's saying all that much. The cabin reminded me of my days as a small boy when I had nothing but a pack of gum and a few million dollars to my name. I like this episode, but it's not my favorite of the season. One thing I loved were the improved graphics. You could tell that they spent a lot of time perfecting that comic book style, and it worked really well. That's true, George. 
The graphics of this game are a big step up from the first season. Not just that, but the technical aspects of the game were far superior in terms of effects, camera direction, and movement. While we're at it, I want to say that this season has maybe the best soundtrack of any Telltale game ever. Hmm. But Barry, did they not reuse many of the old music tracks from the first game? Yes, they did. But I'd argue that in some ways they were far more effective here than in the first game. I understand that might be a controversial opinion, but I stand by it. I think this episode does a lot right for me. Seeing Clementine having to deal with life's hardships on her own and seeing her come out on top gives me a feeling of pride. A pride I haven't felt in a long time. The eerie atmosphere, the soundtrack, and the evolution of Clementine from how we last see her in season one makes this episode an easy S tier. Barack, I must concur. There are some fantastic moments in this episode, but I can in good faith say it's the best episode of the season. The second half with the cabin is cozy as hell, but the first half in the woods is what I would call boring as shit. It's B tier for me. Yeah, I'd put it B tier too, like B for Bush. Sorry, but I have to put it C. It has some high points, I agree, but the beginning with how Krista and Omid were dealt with just left too sour of a taste in my mouth. All right then, the consensus seems to be somewhere in the middle, so B tier it is. One last thing before we move on. Go ahead. The finale choice I'm sure we all recognized was reminiscent of the Carly and Doug choice. The choice between Nick, a flawed and impulsive Ben clone, or the wise and kind old bite victim who poses a threat to Clementine. I was critical of the Doug Carly choice, but I have to say this choice was handled much better and had clear positives and negatives either way. Very much agreed. Now let's talk about episode two, A House Divided. To be honest, I don't know how to feel about this one. It has a lot going for it, but I feel there were missteps in the execution of its ideas. What do you guys think? Best episode of the season. Great pacing throughout. We learn more about Luke, form a good friendship with him, and we get introduced to the best villain in the series. I must say, I must say, the joy that filled my heart, the water that flowed from my eyes like glistening crystal when I first looked upon him, shook me to my very core. It was an indescribable feeling seeing him after such a long time. His amazing mustache, that rugged and worn beard, his new jacket, oh, it gives me the tingles. Just thinking about it, just hearing his voice again makes me so, uh. We get it already. Well, forgive me, Joe, but Mr. Madsen and I go way back. Glad to see he's still out there doing great work. Wonderful man. Oh. As for seeing Kenny, I only ejaculated uncontrollably for nine minutes. Jesus, Whoa. man. Whoa! Why is it every time we do these things, you guys always find ways to be as gross as possible? It was a perfectly natural reaction. I totally thought it was gonna be Krista, but seeing Kenny was cool as hell too. How is he even alive anyway? We never saw him die, Joe. It always said he was lost to the herd. It was always vague. Look, regardless of how much you guys might like him, can we admit that it makes no sense? He got lucky? What the hell does that even mean? I don't think it's that unlikely in the No Ben playthrough. I, I would assume he escaped through the manhole, just like Lee did in episode four, Joseph. I know you may suffer from dementia, but even you should remember that, seeing as it was your favorite episode. Whatever. Also, that wasn't my favorite episode. We both agreed S1E2 was better. Or did we? Maybe not. I don't remember. Hold on, I forgot to take my pills. The guy really forgot to take his remembrance pills, Jesus Christ. While this episode has a lot of good moments, it feels less refined than the first episode for me. Clementine especially feels inconsistent here. What do you mean? One minute we can hug Kenny and laugh at his jokes, only in the next we can tell Walter that we never liked him. That option shouldn't even be possible if you were happy to see him. Remember the scene in episode one where Clementine can ask Rebecca about whose baby it was? Oh yeah, that was badass. That's the thing though, it wasn't. That choice exists to establish that Clementine has some form of protection, ammunition against Rebecca and the cabin crew if they put her life in danger. It seemed like a popular moment with fans, and I think Telltale got the wrong idea. That choice didn't exist to be funny and passive aggressive. It existed to establish Clementine is not below manipulation if it's what she needs to do to survive. It makes me uncomfortable to hear Clem say it, but it also establishes her mindset. In this episode, they stop that in favor of making her sassy. Everyone seems to like it and find it funny, but it just doesn't sit right with me. All right, I'm back. Come on, Barry, you can't tell me you didn't crack a smile at the peaches can or the exchange on the bridge with Luke? Speaking of, remember how difficult the dinner choice was? Kind of funny to think one of the toughest choices in the series wasn't life or death. It was who to sit with, huh? I must have spent 10 minutes thinking about it. My new friends or my old ones, it was really tough. I didn't have to think about it. 
Yeah, well, neither did I. The guy who would do anything to protect Clementine and had a personal connection to her, or the guys who threw an 11-year-old girl into a shed? Yeah, real difficult. You mean the guy who was nothing but an adversary against Lee, Clementine's father figure? They buried that hatchet after Lee's sacrifice if they weren't close. You're 80 years old, Joe. It's time to let things go. You're one to talk about letting things go. Have you seen that belly of yours? Like a giant pumpkin. It's not fair to treat Clementine as though she was Lee. They're completely different people with radically different experiences. Clementine and Kenny barely ever interacted. On screen, sure, but they knew each other for four months. There's no doubt Kenny and Clem had their moments in that time. Clementine had more screen time with every member of the cabin group than she did with Kenny in season one. Doesn't matter. She spends more time with Kenny this season to make up for that. And that's exactly why I didn't like this season. It's make or break with Kenny, and it feels like punishment to do anything smart because he always does the opposite. What are you talking about? Kenny was a hero this episode. Let strangers into his home, fed them for free, I might add, and single-handedly took on Carver and his crew by himself. He only does that because of Sarita and Walter's generosity. Nothing to do with him. Incorrect. Also, that one man stand nearly got everyone killed. Completely wrong. Him trying to take on Carver was a stupid move. Listen, Joe, Kenny and his crew were minding their own business. He has a girlfriend, a warm home, food, power from wind turbines, living his best life. Then the cabin crew shows up and all it goes to complete shit. Nick kills Matthew, something he never finds out, by the way. Walter dies, his girlfriend gets taken hostage, and he's forcibly taken from his home and made prisoner. What should he have done, Joe? Sit on his ass and do nothing like what you've done your entire presidency? Even Luke abandoned his own group. Kenny stayed and would have laid down his life for them. Exactly what I said. Instead of thinking through things and joining Luke, it's possible the both of them could have freed the group without any casualties later. Kenny had no idea about who Carver was. He just saw a group with guns show up on his front doorstep. For all he knew, it was the beginning of a mass execution of his family. You're just wrong, Donald. At the end of the day, look at what happened to everyone involved. Things could have gone a lot differently had Kenny chilled out. Sometimes it's better to do nothing than try everything and screw it all up, just like your presidency. Speaking of the cabin group, we haven't talked about them. I don't know how to feel about the cabin group. Nick's arc is somewhat interesting. His guilt and humanity is well written, but it goes nowhere after this episode. I do prefer Rebecca here than the previous entry. It felt like she was trying to fit the role of Larry, and I don't think they can retread that character scenario as well as they did before, so her change here is appreciated. Sarah was a massive wasted opportunity. Alvin was just kind of there. Luke, I'm mixed on. He had a noble character and a good heart, but wasn't strong enough to make the tough decisions like Lee would have. Him bringing Clementine with him to the bridge was dangerous and stupid. To be honest, the more I think about it, I feel like Kenny's group had more going for them. I'm not a fan of the cabin crew that much either. Sarah was a real cutie though, nice hair. This guy is creepier than Troy ever was. Okay, but can we talk about the awesome scene with Clementine teaching her new best friend the importance of the Second Amendment? That was a fun scene. Nice little callback to Clementine's training from season one. I had such high hopes for Sarah. God damn it, Telltale. Well, I can't say I didn't see it coming. I thought they were going to pull the Sarah kills a zombie thing like what Clem does in Saving Molly. That would have been a cool parallel for sure. Can we also talk about how badass Clementine is talking back to Carver? I felt like a proud dad. Clementine didn't take any shit from Carver. The dialogue was great, although I do feel the setup was a little sloppy. Everyone is just conveniently missing for that scene to happen. Carlos could have answered the door with a shotgun. Carver clearly suspected someone could still be in the house, so him walking up was kind of dumb. Besides that, I do think this episode has a lot of high points. I just don't think we get the best of Clementine, so I'm only giving it a B. An improvement over episode one, I would have given it B tier, but bringing back Kenny was a mistake, so I'm only giving it a C. S tier, obviously. S tier, no question about it. I guess we'll meet in the middle and give it a tier. Before we move on, can we all agree that Pete is the goat? Absolutely. Hell yeah. Oh, for sure. All right then. Episode three, In Harm's Way. I'm not sure where to start with this episode. I'd say that there's some great character moments with Luke and Kenny. One moment in particular is where Kenny takes responsibility for the radio and loses his eye. He gets some great lines for his recovery, but he also does something we've yet to really see in the entire season. And that's for someone to take accountability and comfort Clementine. 
Clem is an incredibly mature and rational person, but she's still an 11-year-old girl. This is probably the first time she's been shown some grace and allowed to be a kid, even if just for a brief period. Brief period? Wasn't that season three? Just goes to show that Kenny is really just Lee's successor by how far he's willing to go to protect her from serious danger. Yeah, and in the beginning, he nearly put everyone in harm's way with his stupid plan. Trust the plan. It worked out in the end, didn't it? You call that working out. It's not like they had many opportunities. It's only because of Bonnie that the group had any chance to escape. It was now or never. Sooner or later, Carver was gonna crack the whip. Look at what happened to Reggie. I'm sure Joe remembers all about cracking the whip from his childhood on the plantation. Too far? Too far. I'm gonna save you the embarrassment you probably don't feel and ignore that comment. The problem is that in harm's way does too many things wrong. We weren't sold on the gameplay in the previous season, and this season has been kind of average thus far, but it's here the flaws become really noticeable. Noticeable? There's no puzzles to solve, which I'm sure Donald is happy about, but those gave us an excuse to explore and talk to people. We get nothing here, not just that, but the conversations we get have been drastically reduced compared to the first season. It's also here where they began to have time to explore sections that cut the gameplay short. You don't think the action scene in the store or the herd scene was cool? Not really. The entire episode takes place inside a department store, but at no point do we actually get to ever explore it ourselves at our own pace. It's like a fairground ride from my childhood. Hands to your side, look but don't touch. I think that policy was implemented because of the incident with no arms Nancy. Anyway, this episode was perfect for exploring, but it was wasted here. And then there's just the story itself. We're thrown between two egomaniacs, Kenny and Carver, two sides of the same coin, with everyone constantly relying on Clementine to do things for them. That was a problem in the previous episode too, though. Remember the wind turbine scene? Clementine volunteered for that to be fair. That's not much better. The problems peaked here for me, and let's not talk about our choices and how those were handled. The way they handled the 400 days characters was so unbelievably lazy, I don't even know why they bothered. I didn't care much for them, but yeah, it was disrespectful. I have to agree. Every scene with Kenny was magical, but any time he wasn't there, the story took a giant hit. What about Carver? Oh, Carver is great too. Not gonna lie, I think Carver had some good points. Why am I not surprised? I hate to admit it, but he was right about the group. Guy had charisma that could almost match me, but he was ill-fitted to be a ruler, too prone to getting emotional, loud, and angry. Only an immature leader would behave that way. Hello, did I disconnect? My problem with Carver is that he starts off charismatic and conniving, but as soon as he's in charge, he becomes a violent, angry sociopath. Sounds familiar. Yeah, he does, but I can't place him. Think real hard, Don. Yeah, no, I'm stumped. Kenny also gets unnecessarily violent at the end of this episode. Well, they couldn't risk Carver and his cronies to come after them. They could have killed him mercifully or tied him up like Luke said. Save the bullet, remember what Lee said. You saw how far Carver was willing to travel to get Rebecca back. If we tie him up and he escapes, you know he'll hunt us down to the ends of the earth. Not worth it. Also, don't complain. You weren't forced to watch. Kenny did it not just for himself, but for Rebecca and Alvin. Rest in peace, big guy. I guess Alvin did get a good ending this episode. Honestly, for a guy whose kid is going to be a major part of the story later on, it's a bit disappointing we didn't learn a whole lot about him. Wait, he can live into episode three? Yeah, you have to become a hostage or convince Kenny not to shoot. Why the hell would you want to do that? Can we move on from this episode now? All right, I suppose we've talked enough about it. Personally, I think this is C-tier. Uh, without like, Kenny's interactions with Clementine, this episode would be pretty mediocre, but I, I didn't hate it or anything. I just feel so it could have been better. Um, I'm going C-tier. D-tier. This episode is just a mess. The introduction of Jane is the only thing saving it from F-tier. I give it C-tier because of how poorly they dealt with the consequences of 400 days. Damn shame, but still a decent episode overall. Man, I don't know. More Kenny should make this a good episode, but there's a lot of lame stuff in the, you know what, to hell with it, A-tier. Yeah, the Kenny scene salvage it. No way in hell is this episode A-tier. What the hell, Donald? Honestly, the more I think about it, the less I like this episode, I'm giving it a D tier. Averaging out, I'll put it at C tier, higher than it deserves, but this is a group discussion, so. I changed my mind, it's S tier, put it higher, Barry. It's C tier and that's final. Pray I don't alter the list any further. Joe, you're kind of grumpy today. Is everything all right, man? Uh, sorry guys, I've been just really exhausted with everything, you know how it is. 
I fell on the stairs on the way to the presidential gaming room for this discussion. Forgive me. Told you, he can't handle the pressure. What did I say? I said he can't handle the pressure. I told them, but did you listen? No, you didn't. And look where we are. Shut up. Episode four, Amid the Ruins. All right, boys, what do we say about this one? Amid the Ruins was a hyped episode before its release for a number of reasons. Firstly, it's got the best episode title screen in the franchise and the only time we ever see No Hat Clementine in season two. Secondly, the group splitting up at the end of episode three seemed like it led into Clementine being on her own again, which could have led to more of what we got in episode one, which I was a fan of. Thirdly, the atmosphere going into episode four felt quite dark. And with Carver out of the way, it could really go in any direction which added to the mystery. Unfortunately, this episode completely misses the mark. It's the first episode I would honestly call downright terrible. Kenny's rehashed storyline with Sarita instead of Katya, the treatment of Nick and Sarah, the overall lackluster approach to the free walks and culmination of how little our choices matter. This episode could have been the peak of the series. Instead, it's regarded as one of the worst episodes in the franchise. With that being said, I'm putting this episode in F tier. Can we all agree with that ranking? No, I disagree. What do you disagree with, Donald? It doesn't belong in F tier, in my opinion. In fact, this episode doesn't even belong on the fucking list for being the giant pile of absolute horseshit that it is. A complete stain on this otherwise amazing series. What the fuck were Telltale thinking? Yeah, it's not great. It takes place in a cool location, but the stuff that really matters, you know, the story, the characters, and decisions are underwhelming. I like this season a lot, but this episode was disappointing, to say the least. I think we'll all agree to just put this in F tier and move on. Wait just a minute there, Barry. Oh, here we fucking go. How did I know Mr. Contrarian is going to defend this steaming turd? Shut up, Donald. You only dislike this episode because Kenny shows his true colors. Who mentioned Kenny? Does he live rent-free in your head or what? He doesn't live in mine. What he does have is his own VIP suite at the Trump Tower, reserved just for him. I dislike this episode because it's hot garbage. That's it. The way he acted like a little baby in the tent hiding away from all his problems, just like he did in S1E3 in the driver's seat and lashing out at everyone, including Clementine, who's been through so much worse, showcase just how unreliable he Holy is. Holy shit. You have some insanely bad takes, but I think this time you fell and hit your head way too hard. Kenny apologizes. If you be understanding of his situation in the tent, he just lost his girlfriend for fuck's sake. Not only that, he takes charge and was shown to be the only competent member of the group while Luke was in the midst of a scandal, not to mention the whole situation with the Ruskies at the end of the story, which- I call bullshit on that, Don. You and Russians have a very good relationship. We all know that. Stop pretending otherwise. Yeah, funny how when I win the elections, it's a problem, but when Enough. Look, I'm all for looking at the best of a bad situation, but are you seriously going to defend this episode? It's universally disliked by almost everyone, but the most diehard of Jane fans. I defend things when I feel like they're getting a bad rap, and this one is. Look, it's far from perfect, I know that, but it's not nearly as bad as people make it out to be. Why not? I'll admit a big reason for my enjoyment of this episode was Jane. But there are a few other aspects I like too, like the great dialogue between Clem, Mike, and Bonnie, and how you can choose where to go first. This episode is the first to really give us the chance to explore and walk around. And there's also the fact that this episode takes place over a day. And we, we literally see everything happen from dawn to dusk. We literally already saw that happen in episode three. No, we didn't. We were stuck inside most of the day and the passage of time wasn't made clear. This is such bullshit, even for you, Joe. Go get yourself some soda or something. The heat is getting to your brain faster than Alzheimer's is. I get it, Donald. Your side doesn't like to talk about who won the Civil War. That's why you don't like this episode. How can you be a U.S. president and not know who won the Civil War? We won. The British lost. Stop pretending you know more about history than I do. Look, Joe, you know I used to be a civil rights lawyer. You can imagine how hyped I was to check out this museum and refresh my memory, possibly learn a thing or two. Instead, the Civil War site is used as nothing more than a backdrop where it may as well be the ruins of Roanoke for all the good it was. We aren't allowed to interact with anything. I'm sorry, Joe, but this is a hard episode to defend. What does it really have going for it? Jane's story mirrors the story of Molly from season one, but she has a more personal connection to Clem, and it gives us a new perspective in which we see Clementine. 
Jane is like the big sister that Clementine never had. Even if you don't like her, you have to appreciate what she did for Clementine and Rebecca. Speaking of Rebecca, can we not agree that Rebecca was at her best in this episode? While I generally was not a fan of the cabin group, Rebecca won me over, and her death at the end of it was heartbreaking. Let's also not forget this is the episode where we see the birth of AJ, an important character that defines the rest of the franchise. As for the Civil War stuff, that's also paralleled in this episode with the tension between uh, Luke and Kenny, something we saw hinted at in episode two. And look how that subplot turned out. It's going in F tier for everything this episode does right. There's, there's about three things it does wrong. Let's move on. I'd give it B tier. Yeah, B for bullshit. Okay, so now we get on to the final episode of season two. There's a lot we can say about this episode. I have a hard time placing it because my favorite scene in the entire franchise happens in this one. And also the absolute worst. I feel this will be the most contentious discussion we'll ever have on these games. I know we've been a house divided so far, and at this point it'd be better to sleep, but this episode is all that remains. There's no going back now. Let's try to discuss this episode peacefully and respectfully, as difficult as this has already been. What are our thoughts about this episode? There's well, no I think doubt this episode that... is... George, what did you think about it? Oh, geez. Well, it's a tough one. For starters, I think this episode had the right amount of action and downtime. The pacing and tension throughout the episode is perfect, and you really start to feel the desperation the group have as things start to get worse. It almost gets too depressing, but there's always something that pushes the group forward, which makes it kind of hopeful. Uh, I feel like that was missing in the last two episodes. Agree there. I'd also say this is my favorite episode in terms of the soundtrack. The atmosphere is loaded with tension. The blizzard section was pretty cool, too. This episode is almost total garbage. You see, the problem with no going back is that it makes no sense, zero sense, ignoring how stupid the whole gunfight section is. Why the hell are we not just gunning down Arvo and moving on? This commie fuck just tried to kill us and our group when we have a goddamn baby on board. Why are we trusting him to not lead us into another trap? It's bullshit. Well, it wasn't totally Arvo's fault. I mean, Shut he... up, George. You saw how I handled your little brother. I can do much worse here, believe me. As I was saying, why in the hell was everyone against Kenny killing Arvo? Why is that even something that's a moral dilemma? We had no problem letting the Howe survivors die because they aligned with Carver, but now it's a problem? Can't believe I'm saying this, but I actually agree with Donald on this one. If you didn't steal the supplies and Arvo walks away, then there's nothing to drive the story. I think what bothers me is that while Jane is obviously justified in this episode to pick on Kenny, this is the one thing she should have backed him on. She was already willing to kill him before and only didn't because of Clementine. The fundamental conflict of the story is so forced and poorly written that it's hard to ignore. Well, I don't know about killing him, but I agree he had no place in the story at all. His attitude and resentment towards Clementine for killing his zombified sister is ridiculous. You don't get to start a fight, then bitch and cry when it doesn't go your way. This is the apocalypse, not the GOP. First of all, fuck you, Barry. Secondly, the only thing that saves this episode is every scene with Kenny. Any scene, Kenny isn't present in the story. It takes a giant fucking hit. Everyone treats him like a fucking villain when he was the only person making a damn lick of sense. Then Jane gets all mad later on and is like, whose stupid idea was it to come up here? And I'm sitting here thinking, well, you didn't say anything earlier, you stupid bitch. Kenny didn't want to go here. You all forced him to. It's insane how badly Telltale tried to make Kenny the villain. Believe me, I know all about that shit. Ignoring Arvo, Kenny's behavior is the reason things played out the way they did. If he hadn't been so violent and aggressive towards him, then things would have played out much differently. Are you just going to excuse the Ice Lake scene? That was Kenny's idea. What about him yelling at Clem all episode and even hitting her in the house? Mike and Bonnie running away? There it is. More of that typical fake news propaganda bullshit. First off, nobody contested crossing it. Everyone agreed. Secondly, fix that memory of yours, Joey. Bonnie dies in the lake. Thirdly, that literally never happened because I wasn't stupid enough to defend the piece of shit that tried to get us killed and lied to us about supplies. Cans of chili, are you serious? Bonnie can live, Donald. You have to break the ice and she'll make it out. Why the hell would I want to do that? Mike and Bonnie's behavior was completely out of character in this episode. They both felt like the most well-reasoned people in the group, so for them to decide to steal the group supplies and run away with Arvo without so much as thinking to bring Clementine with them is absolutely despicable. 
One of the worst scenes ever. Why in God's name they would let Arvo hold a gun over Mike doing so is totally ridiculous. And if Kenny was really a big of a problem as they say he was, why not tie him up and leave him behind? Or hell, if you really want to go there, kill him in his sleep. But this was the best plan they had. It was a difficult situation, guys. Can we really blame them? Yes. A reminder that they just leave her to die. Kenny immediately springs to action to save her. They're straight up evil. They didn't even consult Jane either. I get wanting away from the crazy redneck, but leaving Jane and Clem out of the plan was poor writing to erase then from the story and set up the fight at the end. Before we get to that, I just want to be clear when I say that the flashback scene with Lee is my favorite scene in the franchise. Lee's words to Clem here can be interpreted in many different ways, both in favor of Kenny's ideals and Jane's. It's maybe the best written scene Telltale has ever made, and I won't lie, I cried like a little bitch. It was a tearjerker, all right. But what do you mean flashback? I thought it was a dream sequence. I'm not sure. I'm personally not a fan of the whole bringing back dead characters thing. I've made that pretty clear. But in this case, it felt justified to guide Clementine towards making the right decision with the only sensible adult left in the story. You're not wrong. Ugh. Okay. So now we have to talk about that scene. It's the most controversial scene in the game, so we should be careful to take our time and discuss our opinions peacefully and Kenny did nothing wrong. Jane lied about killing a baby on purpose to set Kenny off. What kind of sick fuck does that? How messed up in the head do you have to be to try and manipulate someone that way? Oh, you want to talk about manipulating? All Kenny has done this entire season is manipulate Clem. Wrong. He constantly plays to her emotions and gets upset at her when she goes against anything he doesn't like. Totally Jane wrong. Jane never lied about anything. She was making a point to prove how unhinged Kenny had become. Skill issue. She never spoke a word. She just didn't answer his question. Kenny had finally lost I'm it, and this was Jane's last ditch how effort to show you, that. Joe? The guy just saw his girlfriend pass away like a week ago. Watch members of the group die. This same group betray him and then shoot the one person he cares most about. Can't say I didn't try. To say he wasn't on edge. It was to be expected. For her to poke and prod at him the entire way through this whole episode just to lead up to a fight is completely insane on her part. She straight up disarms herself and puts her knife away. It was Kenny that charges her and starts the fight for no reason. And she could have told the truth and ended the fight immediately. She didn't because as I said, she's a lying, callous bitch who wanted a surrogate sister because her other sister wasn't as strong as Clem. Oh, you mean like how Kenny treated Clem like a surrogate duck, ordering her around like he's her dad? Clementine doesn't owe Kenny anything. You're a damn right she does. She owes him her survival. Kenny lost his eye because of the radio. Once again, not his plan. He took the fall for that. He did what the rest of the group was too cowardly and weak to accomplish. He's the only one who had a clear drive and clear vision. What does Jane want to do? She wants to head back to the place where we were all prisoners. And Kenny's clear vision was a walking pipe dream based in nothing but rumors. He was willing to stake the lives of Clem, AJ, and himself all for something that might not even exist. But it did as exist, and that's all that matters. But of course, you wouldn't get it. It's called faith, safe and Joe, had supplies. Something no American has in you. Personally, I couldn't bring myself to kill Kenny. He'd been around for too long, but it had clearly affected his mental state. I almost second-guessed myself and left him behind right then and there. But I figured, if Wellington is real, it's possible we might meet up with Krista again. It's not like only Kenny has talked about Wellington. It was well known by even Carver. It was our goal from the start, so it only makes sense to be there by the end. You best believe I let Kenny put down that sick lady. I'd call it a necessary evil, but it was more like a necessary good. Kenny and Clem walked off into the sunset the way it was always intended. Yeah, well, I never mashed a button as hard as I did when I saw that shoot Kenny option. It took 10 episodes, but finally we could be done with this guy. His reign of terror was over, a bit like yours in 2020. Only thing that was mashed here was the baby food your handlers give you. That finger of yours is like a Chinese-made skeleton key. Breaks at the slightest touch. I'd tell you to eat shit, but looking at those steaks you serve, I don't think I need to. Eat your mashed potatoes, you Irish fuck. Not gonna lie, I was kinda hoping to side with Mike and Bonnie. Going to Texas would have been a trip. What ending did you end up getting, George? Oh, well, I let Kenny kill Jane then, I shot him and went it alone. God damn. What the fuck? I guess you could say we're a house divided. Ha 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 Right, guys? Ha ha. I made that joke five minutes ago. This episode is kind of hard to rate. 
Aside from the dumbest shit Kenny hate throughout, he was vindicated by the end, proven by how amazing his two endings are. Redeems the entire thing for me. I'd give it S if we got the opportunity to kill that scrawny fuck Arvo. Instead, I'll give it a solid A. How confident Clem is in the alone ending makes this an S tier grade for me. To see her come so far would make Lee proud. I'm glad they gave us a lot more time to connect with Jane and learn more about her this episode. I'm also glad that finally someone is calling Kenny out on his shit, but it's disappointing that it came at the expense of every other character in the story getting dumber, so I can only give it C tier. I'm struggling. The Lee scene is magnificently written, and I really love the music in this episode, but the quality of writing here was some of the worst it's ever been. Every conflict is poorly set up and even more poorly resolved. The endings are generally well done, but the, uh, the Wellington ending feels canon and is the most sensible of them all. For me, it's C tier, but averaging out, it lands in B tier. Howes isn't sensible? It took Carver a large group to maintain and control Howes. Even if you bring the family in, that's still not enough people to properly protect it. Wellington wasn't guaranteed to be safe for Clem either. Besides, if you want to talk about defense, look at what happened in season three. If we're talking flashbacks, then let's talk about how going with Jane panned out, shall we? Relax, guys. What do we think of the season as a whole? I'd say it was great, not my favorite, but I still liked it a lot. Honestly, it's my favorite season. Ignoring the complete and utter hot garbage that was episode four and a few parts of episode five, more Kenny was completely unexpected and a dream come true. I loved it. Pales in comparison to season one. The level of writing is far worse, there's less gameplay, our choices mean less, although I suppose we have to give them credit for actually giving us the multiple endings we talked about last tier list. Ultimately though, it's a much more shallow experience only saved by Jane in the last act. It's hard to rate. I think I'd still put season one as the best. What season two made me realize as I was playing is how much I missed Lee. Season one was great in a lot of respects, but I think Lee is what made the game I like Clementine a lot, truly I do, but she was so much more with Lee by her side. Without him, she's just not the same, without his spirit. The first episode was great, and I was really hoping that the series would continue that momentum moving forward, and I just don't think it did. It's made me think that maybe season one was just lightning in a bottle. You can't recapture perfection twice. That's not to say season two was awful. It had moments where I believe it peaked beyond season one. But for me, it's just too messy of an experience to be considered better overall. Well, anyway, guys, I think it's fair to say that we all maybe got a little heated from this discussion today. But at the end of the day, it's all our interpretation. We all chose for what we thought best fit Clementine's journey moving forwards. So uh, I guess I just want to say thanks for being here. You're right, Barrick. At the end of the day, it's just a game. And I think we can all respect one another's opinions, even if I don't quite understand some of your choices. You know, I'll be first to admit that I sometimes take things a little too far. I'm just a very passionate man, maybe the most passionate man ever when it comes to this series, and I get worked up. I'm sorry for the insults. Hey, how about we head down to the mall and get some ice cream? Good idea, George. I'm buying. Really? You're buying? Just this once. I'm having mint chalk chip. Heh. <laughs> My first job was working at an ice cream store. Can't go wrong with chocolate. It's the taste I've always known. You can ask Michelle. Uh, yeah, we know. Chocolate chocolate chip is the best. I'm gonna have myself that tasty big cherry vanilla. I hope you aren't planning on buying a whole tub. Why would I do that? That's far too much for one person. I'll have two scoops. Yeah, I figured that. I gotta tell you guys, I'm super excited to see what adventures Clem and Kenny are gonna have in season three. Oh man, it's gonna be great. They're gonna be an amazing duo, just the two of them, building castles in the sky. I'm too excited thinking about it. I gotta cool down. See you guys at the Dairy Queen. Donald, hold up a sec. Uh, damn it, can't say I didn't try to warn him. Nah, it's best he finds out for himself. Anyway, there's no way I'm passing up free ice cream. I'll see you two there. Yeah. Something wrong, Barry? Ah, it's nothing. It's just last tier list before you joined, Donald left suddenly. I was gonna ask him about it, it seemed urgent. Oh, that. Kind of a long story, but the creator of this video thought it would be funny if Trump was in prison for the sequel video and had played season two on a phone that was snuck in by a supposed cellmate of his, who was part of the Mexican cartel. When he started writing it, it wasn't really all that funny and distracted from the tier list. I think it's best if we just pretend it was his lawyers that cut down his internet to stop him making any more potential slanderous statements. What the hell are you talking about? See you down there. I really need to find a new hobby. 
and new people to hang out with.